Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. Before I introduce our guest speaker today, I'd just like to thank our co-sponsors for this webinar, the UCLA Center for the Study of Religion, the Center for Near Eastern Studies, and the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. Now let me introduce our guest speaker, Professor Nachshon Perez. He's an Associate Professor in the Department of Political Studies at bar -Alam University. He received his PhD in political science from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And I'm also pleased to note he's been a postdoctoral fellow at the Nazarian Center at the University of California, Los Angeles. His first book, Freedom from Past Injustices, was published by Edinburgh University Press in 2012. His second book, Women of the Wall, Navigating Religion in Sacred Sites, co-authored with Yuval Jabani, was published by Oxford University Press in 2017 and won the Best Book Award from the Israel Political Science Association. And his most recent book, also co-authored with Yuval Jabani, Governing the Sacred, Political Toleration in Five Contested Sacred Sites. It was published this year by Oxford University Press, and this is what he will be talking about today. So without any further ado, let me turn over and welcome Professor Nashon Perez. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dov. Um, thank you, Professor Waxman, for inviting me to give this talk. And also, I want to thank Moira Rezni, who well, I know from my time at the center. And as uh, Professor Waxman indicated, I was a postdoctoral fellow in 2008 and 2010. It was very nice um, to be speaking at this center again, even though it's via Zoom, not actually being at UCLA. So I'll be speaking today of um, uh, the new book uh, that I published with the Yuval Jobani. Um, Oxford University Press titled Governing the Sacred, Political Toleration in, in Five Contested Sacred Sites. And so um, a little bit about what we'll be speaking of today. So um, brief explanatory remarks, a little bit why um, we title Contested Sacred Sites as thick sites, then uh, a little bit about methods, about research methods, uh, our context methodology, the models, the models of governance of contested sacred sites and why do we use models? And then the five models, non-interference, divide dividing separate preference, second and the two second order models, status quo and closure, and some concluded remarks. Okay. So contested sacred sites residing, residing in public spaces or thick sites, a difficult challenge um, for states, for countries to govern or to manage. They are often the source of conflict and violence, and there's not enough material which enables a comparative and systematic analysis of such sites. This presentation provides a succinct version of our book, Governing the Sacred, Political Tradition and Five Contested Sacred Sites, and we present a novel typology or mapping of the models used to govern such sites within democratic contours via contextual methodology, second and following a broader assessment of the various models. So what are those sites? So these are sites located in public spaces, sacred or significant to at least two groups. These groups compete over ownership, access, usage rights, permissible religious conduct, management, allocation of space, time slices, and many, uh, many other aspects of such sites. Major examples include the Babri Majid Rambambu in Uttar Pradesh, India, the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif in Jerusalem, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, Devil's Tower National Monument in Wyoming and others. So these are uh, the picture of the sites. So um, from left to right in the uh, top um, um, uh, 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 line. So we have Devil's Tower of, um, and then we have the Babri Majid, the Western Wall, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Temple Mount. So we suggest to define such sites as thick sites, following uh, Clifford Geertz, the famous anthropolo anthropologist from, from Princeton, who spoke about thick description. So we call those sites thick sites. But a thick site, we denote a site, typically, but not necessarily religious, which is loaded with different and incompatible meanings that are attributed to it by different agents. From this agent's view, such meanings are highly significant, and consequentially, these sites are irreplaceable. So the definition of a thick site suggests four major features of such sites, being loaded with different meanings, incompatibility, significance, and irreplaceability. 
So these are the sites that we will be analyzing today. So a little bit about research methods. Um, so in our research, we attempt to move in a context sensitive fashion from the details of the various case studies to more general understanding of the category of governance methods of contested sacred site. So this, this kind of work cannot be done in the abstract. We can't, this is not our philosophy, right? So we found that the best way to understand or create such categories of governance models is to examine actual case studies. Some examples as noted include the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Babur Majid Rambabui, the Western Wall and others. Now we limit our exploration because no research can cover everything. Those models that are within democratic norms broadly conceived. So theocracies and oppressive secularism are hence excluded. So why do we need models, right? Why not just intensive studies in cases? So the reason is that models can help us in the following way. So models can be described as a simplified, isolating approximations of a given piece of targeted reality. The models illustrated in a parsimonious way here are approximations or idealizations of much more complex sites, events, and histories. The main test of such modeling is the ability to classify none as yet observed cases into the noted models using the lessons regarding examined and classified cases and categories to better understand not as yet observed numeral other cases. Now models of what? Governance models of contested sacred sites or fixed sites. Which models enter our topology? We have five models, non-interference, divide and separate, preference, and the two or the models and a, a term or a concept that I'll explain, status quo and closure. So let's begin with the first model that is non-interference. In this category, the state or the government does not manage a given contested sacred site in any religiously relevant way or in any way that follows the doctrine of a particular religion. The state maintains law and order, and if the need arises, utilizes an usher function as in a museum or a theater or a similar coordination enabling tool. In the book, we talk about nudge and signaling. Um, so there are uh, several tools, but nothing else. So nothing religiously significant. Religious worship and understandings are left to the believers themselves. The location, physical structure, and the core remain as is, with alterations made only on non-religious grounds. This category relies on the broader model of separation of the state, well known to, uh, well, Americans via the First Amendment to the US Constitution. Note, however, that there is no necessary linkage between a model adopted at a given fixed site and a general model of religious state relations in the country in which the site resides. The reason is that fixed sites are kind of special entities, so that require a different and specialized uh, treatment. So a brief example is the Devil's Tower in Wyoming, United States, or Bell Lodge, no enforced limits on religious practice or on climbing. However, there's a voluntary climbing during June, as you can see in the sign. And the reason why I classified this instrument, the voluntary climbing ban, into, under, under the non-interference um, category is that the ban on climbing is voluntary. So there's no um, enforceable ban or a, a kind of strict rule which is laid down. So it's voluntary. So I like to climb on, on Devil's Tower or Bell's Lodge, or Bell Lodge in, during June, is a, she or he are able to do so. And so this is one of those instruments that we discuss, signaling and nudging and so on, which is still a part of the non-interference model. If the ban would have been mandatory, right? So that would have been classified as a different model. The advantages of the model, there are plenty of them. Given heterogeneity hetero, hetero of beliefs held by citizens, the state treats all its citizens with equal concern and respect. So the, uh, the government does not pick religious winners. Uh, the model avoids complex entanglement with religion. It protects religions from the heavy hand of the state. It avoids factionalism because there's no picking winners. It is simple to implement. It's a hands-off policy and it enables the free market of religions, which is advantageous for religions and believers. Disadvantages. Well, there's fears of disorder. So what would happen? 
when you just allow people to do whatever they want in those fixed sites? Will there be violence? Will there be conflict? And the model raises fears of violence or the backlash worry. And the backlash worry we define as the threat of violence could and perhaps should justify the maintenance of a given restrictive or inegalitarian governance method at a thick site that is biased in favor of a faction that may otherwise resort to violence. So you can find this fear of backlash in various core decisions and we kind of define it in a slightly more precise way, but you can find it in, in various decisions of Supreme Courts in India and in Israel and other places. And we think that there are important reasons to reject the backlash argument. We have an extended debate of, on, on discussion and also debate about this in the book, but it is indicated, so we um, indicate it here as a disadvantage. Second model, so we have divide and separate. Such, such a policy includes the following three features. The state recognizes relevant parties and groups, divides the thick site, and separates the different sublocations via the creation and maintenance of clear and recognized physical or temporal boundaries within such sites in order to avoid collisions between parties. This policy um, has two different kind of roots. One is even-handedness, also in the United States, um, in the early stages of the Republic uh, was called also non-preferentialism. In an even-handed models, the government is expected to provide resources to religious groups as long as it treats all religions in a similar, fair and equitable, and equitable manner. A second source or root of this model is the European religious, religious wars between, uh, reform, between the uh, Protestants and the Catholics and the uh, um, a model called simultaneum, which is churches that are divided uh, to two um, religious factions, uh, Protestants, Catholic, and you can find uh, churches like that in various places in Europe. So for example, in the Babu Majid Rambambui uh, in India, it was supposed to be divided to three factions, two Hindu groups, one Muslim group. However, recently the Indian Supreme Court has since decided the entire site will be given to Hindu groups. So if you look at the picture, you can see um, uh, the church and how it functions. There, there are two parishes, one Catholic, one Protestant. So you can find churches like that in various places in Europe. So the advantages of the divide and separate model, it avoids direct collisions between religious groups at a given fixed site. It aims to be inclusive and fair. Once decided, it unburdens the state from the need to reach further religiously significant decisions. It is straightforward with the variant bureaucratic institution. Um, the challenges, identifying relevant groups, setting the rules of religious practice, limiting religious practice. It is an end state solution um, that is very strict and it, it excludes unrecognized groups and it forces the entanglement of religion and state. So I see that I have a question here, just a second. Ah, okay, so this just a call for questions, that's fine. Okay, I'm moving on. Third model, preference. So in this category, the state identifies with one denomination and provides some preferential treatment to it. In a given thick site, the state provides a given group with a preferential standing. This can include possession, um, so property rights, usage rights, management, symbolic and other means. Preference does not extend to complete exclusion of none selected groups. That would, that would mean a closure um, model or category that would be introduced momentarily. This category relies on what we call the religious majoritarian approach. So it adopts as its point of departure the claim that there are substantial majorities in some countries that share cultural and religious standings which typically reflect long-standing traditions. Such majorities, the religious majoritarian approach argues, can legitimately use governmental policies and resources to advance their religious and cultural traditions. Such policies do not violate the core liberties and rights of minority groups and observant members of these majority groups. Now, this category might sound a little bit odd, um, given American kind of understandings of the separation between religion and state, However, if you think about European models of religion state relations, many of them have uh, the endorsed or the established church model, which relies on majorities, 
And there's a big debate whether these are legitimate models or not. Uh, David Miller of Oxford recently published a, a, an important article uh, just trying to justify such a majoritarian approach. And if you think about recent decisions, or even of the, Amer of the American Supreme Court, such, such as Espinoza or Amer American Legion, you can find hint hints and bits and pieces of such approaches, even in the United States. Uh, if you look to Canada, for example, so Canada certainly has uh, uh, some versions of the religious majoritarian approach. And so it's, um, it's widely used in, in democratic countries. And, and basically in, the, in this model, we apply the kind of the general approach to fix sites. And so a brief example, um, so in the Western Wall in Jerusalem, uh, you can find an express advantage uh, given to ultra-Orthodox Judaism uh, in the sense that the men's prayer plaza uh, uh, is larger than the women's prayer plaza in a ratio of two to one. So if you look at the picture left of the uh, Mugabe ascent, and you can see that the space allocated to men in the central plaza is much louder than, than, than the one than the space allocated to women left of the Mugabe ascent, okay, uh, of the bridge. So what are the advantages of preference? It expresses the religious majoritarian approach. Challenges, there are many. It is inegalitarian, right? Um, it's not, there's a big debate in the literature, why is the religious majoritarian approach important? There's a, uh, whether majorities should, should have this kind of um, decision-making powers. It, it is difficult to create a distinction between permissible inegalitarianism and impermissible discrimination. For example, in the Swiss, um, Swiss um, minarets referendum, right? In, in which was decided that building of minarets um, uh, 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 as a part of mosques would be illegal in, in Swiss, while the spirals of, of churches are um, legit and, and lawful. So there's a, there's, a, there's a debate whether this is permissible inegalitarianism or yeah, whether this is impermissible discrimination. Um, um, this model is especially prone to bring about social instability following the sensitivity of fixed sites. Um, and it forces the entire government for religion and state because, because the government picks winners, right? The government picks a certain religion to identify with and to uh, pick a certain, certain uh, factions within that religion, usually the, the conservative factions, to adopt and then to provide legal support to. So there's quite a lot of entanglement of religion and state, which many scholars believe that that would be, uh, let's say, unhealthy, both for the religion and for the government. So there are uh, many debates about this. I dedicated the whole article to, uh, to the religious majority approach recently published in a journal called Religions, if anyone is you know, curious about this model. Okay, second order models. So the two following models, status quo and second order models. And set, second order solutions, decisions or models are defined by Cass Sunstein and the legal uh, scholar from Harvard and the late Edna Ullman Mangalit, who was a, um, a brilliant philosopher from Hebrew University who died a few years ago. And, and the co-author, the on second order models and solutions or decisions in which they define second order as follows by second order decisions we refer to decisions about the appropriate strategy for reducing the problems associated with making a first decision second order decision does involve the strategies that people use in order to avoid getting into an ordinary decision making situation in the first instance so the first order decision in this case would be to reach a decision with regard to the veracity of the claims regarding ownership and usage rights in fixed sites, which is basically in second order models, exactly what you don't want to do if you're the government, right? So how do you go about avoiding making those first order decisions? The first strategy is status quo model. The status quo refers to a governmental attempt to maintain an existing state of affairs with regard to conflicting claims to usage and, and or ownership raised by competing groups in thick sites. This model is not anchored in a general approach to religion state relations. This is a model developed and maintained for the purposes of governing contested sacred sites, most notably with regard to the Christian sites in Jerusalem. What are the advantages of this second order 
um, model. So first it unburdens the state functions it is ill-equipped to handle or manage. That is sorting out claims and counterclaims going back hundreds of years regarding rights of possession and usage. B, the status quo attempts to bring about stability. If the state cannot be recruited to promote a given religious group's demand for larger slices of ownership or usage rights, nor to repress other religious groups at the relevant site, the conflict is expected to become less radical and less violent. Furthermore, the status quo creates a set of clear boundaries and rules to be followed by the relevant parties. As such, it transforms the management of the thick site into a bureaucratic mission. So if you look at the picture, well, so this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the different colors represent the different religious groups who have uh, um, um, possession rights or usage rights at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And it follows the uh, status quo document that was um, uh, written by uh, a, um, an officer in the British Army in 1929 called Lano Kast. And you can see both the, how challenging it was to create this model, how controversial it was, and how difficult it would be to reach, I would say, voluntary agreements about the different um, rights of ownership and usage for different groups, and especially in a, at a as sensitive as uh, the Church of the, uh, as the Church of the Holy and remarkably, um, the British Empire and then Jordan and then the State of Israel all followed um, uh, this document by Colonel Cast um, ever since. So, um, so many years by now. So it's um, it's a uh, I would say remarkable device, the status quo. And there's a reason why it's um, been adopted by all those different governments for such a long period. Um, challenges, it's not consent-based, right? Nobody agreed to it. It's not necessarily fair or even-handed. So it usually reflects the results of mere various past power struggles, crystallizing to a state decree at one point. So the, the source of the status quo is a decision of the Ottoman Empire going back to 1757. And it's a result of power struggles between the Ottoman Empire and various European countries. It's not necessarily fair or even handed. Uh, it was just laid out one day and been kept ever since. So um, you get perhaps stability, but you pay in hard currency or fairness. Um, uh, equality, and so on. So unavoidably, this is a substantive decision regarding religion, because you are a part of the, of the site. It neglects, neglects the religious liberties of unrecognized groups and of individuals not belonging to the recognized groups. Because if people belonging to those groups wish to pray or even enter the site, they are dependent on the goodwill of those recognized groups. It's not clear whether a Sina can known for the achievement of stability and its irreversibility because it's a very rigid model and cause resentment among groups who are disadvantaged by the status quo. So if you think about elections, right, you, you lose one election, you may win the next elections, right, but the status quo is here, is here to stay. So you can change it, right? So, so it, it, if you lost at the original point in which the uh, status quo was decided upon, then you, you lose forever. So, so, so the losing groups grow, resent, grow resentful of the arrangement. It increases coordination costs and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre nearly collapsed because the, uh, it was almost impossible to get the, uh, the consent of all the groups about the renovations that were needed. And disagreements regarding the rules of the status quo can be fierce, almost as fierce um, as the original disagreement. One final second order model, which is closure. So the last model to be examined is closure. In this model, the government restricts access to any religious practice in fixed sites, usually as a response to severe and often violent measures among competing groups at the site, or because of the high likelihood such clashes are about to occur. Now there are different versions of this to closure. It can be partially implemented if the government chooses to restrict access for a limited period, 
of during particularly sensitive events can be selectively implemented in situations in which the restriction is levied on some, but not all groups wishing to worship at a given site or fully implemented if the site is permanently closed to all religious factions. So brief examples, all selective closure, the Babri Majid Rambambui in India, um, in which no religious practice was allowed save one Hindu faction for a long period. And the Temple Mount, Ram Sharif, in which there are occasional limits on Muslim entry and prayer. And as is well known, Jewish prayer is banned and a quote, occasionally entrance as well. So advantages, avoidance of violence. So um, you use closure when all other methods you know, fail when you're really worried that different factions or different religious groups might uh, choose violence, right? So it's a kind of um, rude instrument. You use it to avoid violence. And sometimes uh, uh, following uh, immediate violence, and sometimes you, uh, you the precautionary uh, principle. Uh, it unburdens the state from the need to reach more substantial decisions uh, in a given fixed site. The challenges, uh, it's a violation of religious liberty, right? You, you, people are unable to enter the, the, the site or to pray in it. Aside from rare cases, it lacks proportionality. It's a crude instrument, right? It's like a blanket kind of ban. Uh, if done selectively, it's inegalitarian, might even be discriminatory. And it, if, if in place for an extended period of time, it might be self-defeating because as parents, um, young children know taking the toy makes it more desirable right so if you does a you have some sort of um uh, i would say common sense about you if, if it's in place for an extended period of time you might end up having more trouble than you started with and now um, to anticipate questions because we often get questions on this point closure means a ban issued by the government differs from the self-imposed Jewish ban on entering the Temple Mount. So if you look at the sign, the sign says, this is a sign at the entrance to the Temple Mount. It says, the warning, according to Torah law, entering the Temple Mount area is strictly forbidden due to the holiness of the site, the chief rabbinate of Israel. So this is not uh, part of a closure model. It, it, it belongs to non-interference. The reason is, it's that um, there's a signal, right? Or, 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 or or an advice. It's not, it's, not, um, it's not a ban issued by the government, right? It, it um, signals to those who wish to enter the Temple Mount that if they're Jew and they follow Torah law, they should not enter. So that's a different category than closure. But we usually get questions about this, so just to clarify that point. And I'm almost done. So concluding remarks, so the advantages of creating the typology of governance models, as opposed to um, what we had before, which is um, um, mainly intensive study single cases, is improved understanding of arrangements at particular sites, uh, because we did not have models before. It enables classification, so you can look at different sites and classify them under the models. It enables the comparison of different cases, right, if you want to have a, a large end research. And it's useful for decision makers because now they have a menu of options, right? With the uh, advantages and disadvantages of each model, which is an option that did not exist before. And B, I think we have a pluralist conclusion. So there is no one size fits all model. Rather the evaluation of the fit between a site and a model must be contextualized. So you must consider um, the uh, specific details, history, culture, uh, regime, uh, measure of conflict, and other variables before you decide uh, to use a certain model or to shift between models. Um, that's about that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, we have been receiving some questions and I want to encourage all our audience members to continue to send us questions. We have plenty of time uh, uh, for Professor Perez to answer your questions. Um, I'd like to just kind of begin um, to ask you to kind of extend the analysis that you presented of these different models to the specific sites 
that you uh, that you've discussed in the book and so we can kind of get a sense of how each of these models relates to the specific sites in question so for example in at the western wall in jerusalem so the 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 the, um, the uh, model at place right now is the model of preference that is the state identifies with one version of orthodox judaism it implies or uses this model when it um, manages the site. Practically what this means is there's a, a rabbi of the wall, which is um, a state being paid by the state, by the government. And he uh, manages the, uh, the site according to um, ultra-Orthodox uh, principles. And his understandings are backed by the power of the government. So there are police officers, right? So um, if you want to pray according to non-Orthodox um, rules, manners, uh, understandings, you can't. For example, if you want to have a mixed prayer at the center of plaza, that is men and women that pray together, you cannot, right? And there's a police officer enforcing this understanding. So that's the model of... Um, of preference to, to give a, a different uh, example if you think about the status quo right so there are six christian um, groups who have usage and ownership rights at the church of the sepulchre and you cannot change that model so governments can change um, countries that control the area can change so uh, the british mandate and jordan of Israel, the status quo remains, right? So if you were one of the unlucky groups that were not included in the Ottoman decree of 1757, right, you cannot uh, um, be introduced to the status quo agreement. And if you were one of the six groups, but you think you were given, let's say, a smaller piece of the pie, you were entitled to according to ancient um, tradition, heritage, uh, even ownership claims, uh, the model stays. So, um, um, and the uh, basic intuition behind the status quo model is that stability above all. Fairness, uh, historical data about ownership, that all are secondary because um, uh, governments simply are unwilling or un maybe they're not capable of reaching any sound decisions about those these kinds of disputes. And we have lots and lots and lots of uh, petitions that went to court, the Israel Supreme Court, um, um, debates and discussion, disagreements between the Christian factions and the, and the court over and over said, we, we don't have the um, relevant instruments considerations, argument that would enable us to uh, reach a decision, a decision about, about those claims, and we revert to the status quo agreement. Um, so I just, to, just to follow up on that then, um, it, maybe this is my confusion. Um, when it comes to the Kota, when it comes to the Western Wall, Mm -hmm. you're, you're, it's often understood or presented by the, the Israeli government as it's adhering to a status quo model. But you're suggesting that it's not actually the status quo, it's really actually preference. In other words, it's not that the, 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 the government of Israel is leaving the existing arrangements in place that have governed the site for a long period of time, namely the ultra-Orthodox effective control over the area, but actually the state is tipping its, uh, putting its finger on the scale, if you like, and actually um, actively maintaining that uh, and showing a preference. Is that correct? A status quo is 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 a is a, well, basically a term which means right um, freezing a certain state of affairs, right? So that that all it means. So the the with regard to the um, to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, we actually have historical documents discuss, naming the model as the status quo. Right? But you can basically say, um, use the term status quo to, to uh, describe anything and everything, right? Uh, even if it happened yesterday, you could say that we have a status quo that the Los Angeles Lakers is the champion of the NBA, 
right? And referring to yesterday. But that would not make the status quo arrangement of a model according to the way we defined it. Sometimes, because status quo sounds like a convincing or a compelling term, governments adopt it because many people attribute important things that happened in the past. But I think a more accurate um, modeling would be, or a naming of models would be to save the status quo agreement to the one at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and to use preference to the one at the Western Wall. Okay, so what about the uh, the Temple Mount then, and the, the Halal al what Which model does this fall under? And I guess the extension of that has that changed over time. Closure. Closure. That's the model, uh, because it as as we as we explained, the uh, there's a selective closure, right? So it uh, the um, uh, Muslims can enter and pray. Jews are unable to pray there. So that's selective closure. And closure can um, describe two different acts, entrance, so being able to enter the, the site and any kind of religious practice. So it's, it's absolutely uh, selective closure with regard to Jews. And um, uh, at times also selective closure with regard to Muslims, although that's, that's um, um, fairly unusual. So usually the, the situation there is Muslims can enter and pray, Jews can enter, but not, that's selective closure. Absolutely, yeah. So we have a question uh, from Lynn Dodd. I'm gonna read it aloud. Could you discuss ancillary operations that might emerge as a result of these efforts, such as the control of or shaping of public communications about these sacred sites that may be designed to depress the likelihood of violence occurring as a result of any of these models being applied? So, you know, what does, so having adopted one of these models, what are the, the actual kind of operations that the government might do to then in, enforce that particular model or maintain it? So, so it depends on the model. So for example, in even handedness, let's say, right, the, the separation and the separate and divide model. So what, what the government usually does is, is to divide the site, right? So the government selects or chooses uh, certain religious groups, it has their claims to the site and then it, it divides the site, so uh, geographically. So actually dividing the site to devices and say, you can enter here, but you cannot enter there. Or you can use temporal um, uh, slices of the pie, right? So you can use it at, I don't know, 8 a.m. till 10 a.m. And I can use it uh, 10 a.m. till noon, right? Is there, and then we don't overlap. So there, there are, the, the separate and divide model is actually uh, quite loved by governments because it, 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 it takes um, a kind of a big question about holiness and sacredness and you know whose God is better, right? These kinds of questions that are really questions that governments cannot answer and courts refuse to answer. Um, and you, you make them into bureaucratic tasks, right? That you, you can teach uh, soldiers and police officers. And then you tell them in hours and days, such and such, you know, uh, religious worshipers of that group can enter and pray. And in other pe periods, so other people can pray. And if and that's, uh, I would say a preferable uh, solution from the perspective of governments. And it's, it's used by, in used in some of the most controversial locations. So in the cave of the patriarch, but well, this is what they do, right? Um, which one of the most controversial locations, uh, you know, the Gospel Massacre in 1994 and so on, in Hebron. So um, and this is what they do. They divided the site uh, to, to do geographical locations and on certain periods of time, of what details, there are also temporal divisions. And so rather than have the big, big debate, who's better, Jews or Muslims, which is not the question you can solve, it becomes a, um, a series of instructions that you can teach police officers uh, to follow, and then the whole discussion changes. Okay. So we have a question, um, just to uh, add on to that, um, asking, 
are the so this example of a, a divide and separate option to, to mm -hmm. is that something that is um has that ever come about through the decisions made voluntarily by the religious members of the religious groups themselves or the religious custodians of those of those sites or is it something that the go a government uh you know you mentioned the, the example of the the tomb of the patriarchs that's something that the Israeli government actively kind of manages. Are there other examples of that model emerging kind of organically, if you like, without so, doing so, so, so that's so, th so that's a good question. So so the divide and separate model, right, necessitates a top down. So so the government decides um, how to allocate the site geographically or given temporal perspectives or slices of the pie. Right. If it if it's if the government enacts a hands-off approach, right, and and enacts a non-interference approach, and then in a voluntary fashion, like Elena Ostrom wrote about governing governing the commons, right, uh, the participants decide uh, to uh, adopt a certain arrangement. So you you use it on Tuesdays, and I use it on Monday, something like that, right? Then it becomes a non-interference model, because the models are the models of um, uh, they are political models, the models of governance, what the government does, and the government does nothing. And then the individuals, the, the worshippers, decide a certain arrangement. And we have a few examples of those, right? Uh, actually, at the, at, the, at, the tomb, at the cave of the patriarchs or the tomb of the patriarchs, there's some sort of coordination between Muslims and Jews like that, uh, bits and pieces, and, and some of the, um, uh, uh, the uh, churches in Europe which have um, um, worshippers of differing Christian groups. There are some examples like that, and they're not. Um, but they are, they are they are examples of the non-interference category. Great. So we have a question from Gary Gilbert, who's asking, um, how common is it for a site to switch from one model to another? Um, and it, you know, do, and, and what direction do these switches or these shifts tend to take place? And finally, what are the factors that promote these changes? So, you know, how stable are these particular arrangements? How, in what direction do they tend to move? And what forces this movement, or what brings about change from one model to another? Uh, so a very big question and a very good question, right? So, in, in a way, it's not a question that we discuss in the book. I, I can give some thoughts because let me explain what the book, right? The book, <laughs> what, w when we started writing the book, we, in front of us, we had two kinds of um, studies on sacred site. One was intensive studies of, of single cases, S intensive studies of single cases, like Raymond Cohen's book on the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is a fantastic book, but it's, it's, it's really a historian going through step-by-step -step kind of uh, description of the, uh, events in that site. And we have several studies like that. Or we have deductive works like Ron Hasner's, uh, your, your colleague from the University at Berkeley, right, the University of California, who had, who had a deductive kind of uh, intuition about uh, kind of grand theory about sacred sites, very pessimistic that those sites cannot be divided. And we wanted to do something which, is, which, which differed from those both kind of perspectives. We wanted to do a, a proper research of uh, various sites, but we wanted to elucidate from those studies models. So um, it, they felt from those both, uh, uh, I would say, strategies of inquiry. So we wanted to do, um, to build the models. And once we had, and this was a, this was a lot of work, right? Because we had to go over the different studies of single cases. And to list the models, and then to describe the models, and to think about the advantages and the disadvantages of the models. So now we were able to compare them, right, and to classify them and give them names. So now, when you say, "Can we, um, when we move from one model to a different model, this is something you can you can you couldn't do before the book because there were no names to the models. That those did not exist. So we really." Um, when we entered the, the field of the field of research of sacred sites, this is where we this is how we found the field. So now the, the question assumes the work that we did, which but the book was just published. So this is a long introduction to say this is where we are. So this is an excellent question. 
but this is where, where we start our research. Now, to answer your question, two things, right? Two points. One, the models are surprisingly robust and stable. So I'll, I'll go back to the example of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's the same model since, 17, since 1757. So the Ottoman Empire, the British Mandate, Jordan, instead of Israel. No one touched the model. And the reason why the models are so robust and stable is that the, those sites are um, socially sensitive. That's another statement. So governments are really, governments have plenty of other things to worry about, the economy and unemployment and so on and so forth. The last thing most of them want to do is to try to answer questions as, such as, I was here first, or my God is better than your God. These are not questions that governments can answer. So if there's a model in place, it's fairly robust. Right? In order to change such a model, you need some sort of a, and, and you need to, to be politically motivated in a certain way. So if you think about the struggle of the women of the world with regard and reform and conservative Jewish groups attempting to change the, the, the situation at the, um, at the Western Wall and trying to establish a third plaza, there's a lot of pressure and a limited, um, I would say limited success because th those sites are so sensitive. Um, and I think I'll stop here. So just to follow on from that, because we had a couple of questions about the Temple Mount and also uh, the point you made about the, uh, um, the, the tomb of the patriarch, the cave of the patriarch or the Ibrahimi mosque in Hebron. Haven't, haven't those arrangements in fact changed uh, on the ground as in, in the case of the, the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif, there have been, has been some allowance of Jewish prayer uh, occurring in recent years in response to uh, the, the the Temple Mount faithful trying to kind of push for this. And there have been growing numbers allowed, which are kind of challenged the status quo. And somebody also asked um, about the Ibrahimi Mosque and the division um, after the Goldstein, uh, you mentioned about Goldstein massacre, changes put in place afterwards. So having, I mean, the question may be to kind of to tie these two together, um, is it possible that behind the maintenance of these models, actual changes do occur, but the kind of, the, the model that presented is, is still the same, but actually on the ground, people are seeing changes happening? Um, the, 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 the model would, with regard to the Temple Mount, it's the same model since 1967. Um, Jewish entrance is allowed, Jewish prayer is not allowed. There are many, 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 many Supreme Court petitions, and the response is always identical. Jewish entrance is allowed, Jewish prayer is not allowed. So that's the legal situation. It's been there since 1967, it did not change. Um, um, it's true that there are social movements who wish to change that. And my colleague at, my colleague for the, for the research, not in the same university, Lehi Ben Shitrit, at, um, wrote a fantastic book about that, recently published, and um, uh, there are social um, attempts to change the model, but the model is very robust. So Muslim entry and prayer is permissible. Jewish entrance is permissible. Jewish prayer is not um, for, um, since 1967. Um, with regard to the cave of the patriarch, the tomb of the patriarch, uh, it's the same model. Uh, uh, what happened since 1994, if you read the report, the com of the uh, committee, of the research uh, um, commission, the, um, um, the, the massacre, it, it, it became more robust and, and strict, but it's still um, um, a separate and divide. So the models themselves are pretty robust and for a reason, it's, it, to change them would mean, that because there's so much focus on those sites, and most governments are, are simply have too much to do uh, on more mundane issues. Um, and even when, when, when there are, um, think about Hagia Sophia in uh, school, uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of noise about that, but it, it, I'm yet to see an, a, a natural change in the entrance and prayer arrangements over there. So the deco change and the name and so on, but I don't see, if you want to look at a, at a real life change, you look at the Babri Majid Rambabui because the Indian Supreme Court, which a, a very 
a dramatic decision, basically handing the, the entire site to Hindus. And, and that's, that's a radical change. That's a change. And um, I'm, it's, it's fairly recent, right? It was decided in June or July. So that would be interesting to see what would be the outcomes or the results of that change. So that's a real change. But I think it's the exception that proves the rule. And it's very interesting to see what will happen on the ground in that site. I see. Um, so I'm going to turn to some more uh, some more questions that have come in. Um, let's see. There's a question um, asking to just to, to follow on actually from a question that you uh, answered earlier regarding the if you're trying to have um, what models of public communication about religious sites, sacred sites, to promote toleration. Are there are there ways in which um, different governments, different regimes message to the to the publics about these sites along with the actual management of them so that's a good question so the premises of the entire project as the those sites are sites of conflict so this is where you start and and then you try to manage them or govern them in a way which would uh, attempt to achieve two different goals one is religious liberty so to allow people to enter and to pray at those sites according to their understanding. And the second one is to keep social stability or social order. And you navigate carefully uh, between or among these two dif differing goals. Um, how to promote toleration and inclusiveness in those sites. Um, so here, I'm here, I'm, uh, so I don't want to sound like Ron Hasner was very pessimistic about those sites, because Ron Hasner simply says, these are sites of conflict, period. Any arrangement you will have, it would become top down. This Hobbesian sovereign will just clap down and kind of strongly. And, uh, so we're not, I'm not that pessimistic. And some of the sites are actually, some of the models are much more optimistic. I think that one kind of encouraging example large devil's tower in Wyoming and, uh, and the uh, volume which which was kind of very um, optimistic I would say because what the indigenous people said we don't want a mandatory ban before you um, just sorry to interrupt you I think it might be helpful for the audience to to tell us a little bit about that site uh, oh yes yeah, so, so, so that's a site that's a site um, uh, uh, sacred to several indigenous groups and, and uh, uh, it's also um, a popular climbing site. So people like to climb it. And, and, and these two groups uh, had uh, collisions, right? Because you think about climb, doing snappling over the Western Wall, right? So it's, it's unheard of. Uh, so, uh, but in the, in the conversation between the indigenous groups and the climbing groups, what the indigenous people said, and that was, I think, admirable is that they don't want a mandatory ban because the mandatory ban forces you to respect their culture or their tradition or the heritage. So that's not real respect because you are forced not to climb. So that's not something that we wanted, said the indigenous people. Let's have a sign and explain that this is sacred for us and what you're doing interferes with our religious practices and let's see what happens. And and we, uh, there, there are statistics published about the number of people climbing during the month of June, which is the month of, well, it's, it's a summer solstice, doesn't matter, this is where religious practice takes place. And the number of climbers went down and now it, it goes up again. So there's a renewed debate, but at least the attempt, there, were, there was a process of deliberation between the indigenous groups and the climbers and the result was a voluntary ban. And so that's a kind of a sign of hope. Also some of the cooperation between Muslims and Jews at the um, at the uh, cave of the patriarch, the tomb of the patriarch, kind of uh, provides uh, hope because there's some sort of um, of voluntary cooperation, and so so there are, I would say, some some limit, limited measure of success uh, with regard to voluntary models in those sites. So not as pessimistic as Hasnell's conclusion, but these are sites of conflict. So we should like you know, look at the reality. Um, yeah, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just gonna, we, we only have time for kind of maybe one, one last question, I think, but I'm gonna return to a question because one of our audience members has, has raised the point and provided some evidence to suggest that actually in practice, Jews 
have been allowed to pray in recent months or years on on the Temple Mount, um, and that you know the, that the the actual arrangements there have shifted over time, not a court, not uh, officially but unofficially, um, and that there have been groups. I mean, I, I um, there have been groups of of Jewish worshippers who, who have been allowed at certain times. So, in other words, you know, house. I guess this is partly, particularly focused on on probably. Uh, what's often described as the most contested of all sacred sites. Um, uh, how stable are they, these arrangements? Are, and particularly, you mentioned that there is a, a kind of a social movement challenging them, uh, that's been challenging the, the status quo. Um, but has it in fact succeeded, not merely in challenging it, but actually altering it on the ground? At least that is, I think there's certainly widespread concerns that that is taking place. The model did not change. So the legal situation has not changed. We, we go over at the relevant chapter of the book on many, many court, uh, petitions to the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, various arguments were made, but the model remains as is. So uh, ever since 1967, Jewish prayer is not allowed. Jewish entrance is allowed, even though it's limited. Uh, Muslim prayer and entrance is allowed. It's permissible if there were, I mean, I, that that's the legal situation, and uh, but, it, but I guess the, question is asking, yeah. is the practical situation is has does the actual practice differ from that model? I mean, the legal situation may be that it's officially banned, but in practice, there has been uh, accommodation of this movement to allow more Jewish prayer. Does 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 certain social movements does the faithful of the um, uh, the Temple Mount people. The faithful of the Temple Mount, and there are also uh, women's groups that are working, uh, what Lee Ben Shitrit called the, the uh, domesticating effect. So women with babies uh, uh, ascend to the, to the mount and so on. But, but the legal situation is as is, it, it doesn't change uh, under many different governments, uh, left and right, uh, recent and going back to next to 67. So, so the model is pretty robust. That would be, yeah. Um, um, and just maybe we have time for one last question. Somebody asked about the uh, Rachel's tomb. Um, what, where, what, what, I mean, this, um, what model would that, what the management of Rachel's tomb in, in, in West Bank? That, not, that I, I, can't, I can't answer from the top of my head. I can check, but that's, that, that was not one of the sites that we covered or discussed or examined in the book. Yeah. I'll be happy to look at it, yeah. Okay, well, um, I think we're, we're uh, out of time now. So let me just thank you, uh, Professor Perez, for that really fascinating presentation. And if you have questions for him that we ha didn't have time to answer, I'm sure he would be happy to answer those questions. If you want to send him an email, please do. Um, and um, we will uh, hopefully have this uh, up on our website, a recording of this, so you, you can share it with uh, your, your friends and colleagues. Um, so thank you, Professor Perez, for joining us. And thank, thank you much. all for joining us today in this very uh, enlightening uh, and interesting presentation. Thanks again. Thank you very much.